On August 6, 1945, an atomic bomb dropped from the B-29 in Nola Gay incinerated Hiroshima and over 100,000 of its inhabitants. Three days later, Nagasaki suffered a similar fate. Faced with the threat of annihilation, Japan finally accepted Allied surrender terms. On September 2, 1945, the surrender was signed here, upon the deck of the battleship Missouri, then anchored in Tokyo Bay. UPI correspondent Frank Tremaine, who had covered the war beginning with Pearl Harbor, described the ceremony. A small American vessel is sighted moving through the fleet. It comes alongside at 8.50 a.m. Mamoru Shigemitsu, the Japanese foreign minister, struggles to the top of the stairway and onto the deck at the head of his party. There are 11 of them, seven generals and admirals in uniform, men formally attired in top hats, morning coats, and striped pants, and one little guy in a rumpled white suit. At 8.59, MacArthur appears, followed by Nimitz and Halsey, and steps to a small nest of microphones a few feet from the table. His face is grim, his voice deep and intense. His hands tremble visibly as he reads a brief statement. It is my earnest hope, he says, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. A world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice. The most catastrophic war in history was over. It is estimated that more than 60 million people perished, although the true number will never be known. The secret development and deployment of the atomic bombs had provided a dramatic end to World War II, yet prior to August, victory over Japan had still seemed far beyond the horizon. Resting control of Japanese-held islands in the Pacific had become increasingly more brutal as the Pacific War reached its climax in April. The costly fight to take tiny Iwo Jima in February and March was but a prelude to Okinawa, the dress rehearsal for the invasion of the Japanese home islands. This is one of the landing beaches on the island of Okinawa, the last stepping stone before the long anticipated invasion of the Japanese home islands. I'm Jan Herman, historian of the Navy Medical Department. On April 1st, 1945, American soldiers and Marines waded ashore here following the heaviest bombardment of the Pacific War. Unlike the contested and bloody landings on every island since Guadalcanal almost three years earlier, here there was virtually no opposition. Where was the enemy? More than one seasoned veteran noted that it was April Fool's Day. Japanese strategy had evolved since the bonsai attacks of the earlier island battles. At Iwo Jima, the first wave had been allowed to land on the beaches before encountering a ferocious counterattack. But on this seemingly quiet spring day, the Americans noted a peaceful landscape untouched by war. The bow doors opened and out came the tractors and we had uh, 50 and 30 caliber machine guns mounted on the front of the tractors and they would scan the beach as we came ashore. We were on the first wave and my uh, mission of course was to see that anybody got hurt and get them patched up. Uh, but we had no casualties on the departure and the surprising and very rewarding part was no casualty on the beach. Being a Pelu veteran I thought we were going to get our, uh, our asses shot off uh, on laying in Okinawa and it didn't happen. I mean, we walked ashore, and uh, the nature of the defenses was such that uh, the Japanese had pulled inward, had set up a uh, concentric uh, rings of defense around Shuri Castle, and it wasn't until perhaps about the 19th of April or so that the, uh, we really came uh, against a strong, strong opposition. If the landings on April 1st, 1945, and the days immediately following seemed a breeze, American forces would soon bog down as they approached Lieutenant General Mitsuru Ushijima's Shuri Line in the south, where the topography gave the defender every advantage while presenting the attacker with steep escarpments, deep ravines, rolling hills, limestone ridges and caves, 
and even fortified tombs of the native Okinawans. As the rains began to fall and the offensive stalled in a sea of mud, the battle began to mimic the nightmarish stalemate of World War I trench warfare. Despite air attack, naval gunfire from battleships and cruisers, and large caliber howitzers, it would take the resolute soldier and marine armed with Browning automatic rifle, Garand, carbine, grenade, and flamethrower to flush the Japanese from their fortified holes. This is a portion of the so-called Shuri Line. Lieutenant General Mitsuru Ushijima chose to make his stand in the south. Not having the means to defend Okinawa in its entirety, the plan was to grant the invaders the beach, then lure them inland, force the Americans to confront defenses of concrete and steel with interlocking fire zones, compel them to destroy networks of subterranean ant farms packed with fanatical men willing to sell their lives dearly. Robert Bush was a newcomer to combat. The 18-year-old corpsman had encountered death soon after coming ashore on 1 April. While attending one of the few fatalities that first day, he found himself looking down the barrel of a Japanese rifle, pointing from a cave much like the ones behind me. For some reason, the Japanese soldier did not fire. About a month later, as his unit engaged the Japanese, Bush was called upon to tend a fallen Marine. The events that followed earned him the Medal of Honor. A green lieutenant, new to the unit, ordered Bush's platoon to secure a nearby hill by 8.30 in the morning. The veteran Marines knew better. Wouldn't it be safer for naval gunfire to soften up the enemy positions first? No. The hill was to be assaulted without further delay. In just a few short minutes, several riflemen were dead, and the lieutenant lay wounded in a shell hole at the foot of the hill, just yards from the Japanese defenders. The teenage corpsman had to make a critical decision. The corpsman doesn't want to give up his life so that he doesn't have any protection for the rest of them, but the election to go out there and just become a casualty uh, wasn't very rewarding, but the fact that, that this fellow was hurting was part of my job, so I elected to go after him. And I went out and got into the hole with him, so I, I gave him albumin, and I noticed his eyes came back within about 10 minutes, and, or maybe five, and he, uh, he started being more, a little more active and moving around a little, and he said, there ain't no nips here, Doc. And I said, Jim, they're all over the place, and we're going to have to keep very quiet in order to be able to have both of us get out of here. And I, by that time, I had taken his carbine and checked it to see that it was full of ammunition, and he had 15 rounds in the clip, and he had 30 on the stock. So I took the safe off and set it by the top of the shell hole, and then I was holding the can of albumin, and I could feel a little tug on it. I thought he was rolling over. And about the same time, I look up on the hill and I see a Japanese head come up. So I took the carbine, and I, I, every place I could see a head come up that I knew was not our people, I fired in the berm with the, with the carbine. And things were running pretty well until I noticed the can, the can of albumin moving. And I turned around, and, and Jim had, had jumped up and run across the field. When he did this, he gave away my position, and his position too. And I had to write him off then. I thought, he's, he's gone, because he's out in the open. If they're up there looking, they're going to nail him on the way out, and I'm in deep trouble. And about that time, here come some hand grenades. The first one went off like this, and I threw my arm up, and it took my right eye out and uh, did a little damage to my left arm. Then I had two more after that that were more superficial, because I was moving out by then. They had outnumbered me. I'm the only one out there. So I, I went up on the hill, went around there, and uh, was able to neutralize the Japanese that were left. My timing was very good, and my luck was great, and the Lord was looking after me because I was able to walk off of that hill on my own power with nobody else there. And I did that uh, some minutes after this encounter. 